Celtic Folk and Fairy Tales, edited by Joseph Jacobs. Section 2. Gulish. There once was a boy in the county Mayo. Gulish was his name. There was the finest rath a little way off from the gable of the house, and he was often in the habit of seating himself on the fine grass bank that was running round it. One night he stood, half leaning against the gable of the house and looking up into the sky and watching the beautiful white moon over his head. After he had been standing that way for a couple of hours, he said to himself, My bitter grief that I am not gone away out of this place altogether. I'd sooner be any place in the world than here. Ah. It's well for you, white moon, says he, that's turning round, turning round as you please yourself, and no man can put you back. I wish I was the same as you. Hardly was the word out of his mouth when he heard a great noise coming like the sound of many people running together and talking and laughing and making sport, and the sound went by him like a whirl of wind, and he was listening to it going into the wrath. Musha, by my soul, says he, but ye're merry enough, and I'll follow ye. What was in it but the fairy host, though he did not know at first that it was they who were in it, but he followed them into the rath. It's there he heard the full parni and the full parni and the raplehuta and the rulia bulia that they had there, and every man of them crying out as loud as he could, My horse, my bridle and saddle, my horse and bridle and saddle. By my hand, said Gulish, my boy, that's not bad, I'll imitate ye, and he cried out as well as they. My horse and bridle and saddle, my horse and bridle and saddle. And on the moment there was a fine horse with a bridle of gold and a saddle of silver standing before him. He leaped up upon it, and the moment he was on its back, he saw clearly that the wrath was full of horses and of little people going riding on them. Said a man of them to him, Are you coming with us tonight, Gulish? I am surely, said Gulish. If you are, come along, said the little man, and out they all went together, riding like the wind. Faster than the fastest horse you ever saw hunting, and faster than the fox and the hounds at his tail. The cold winter's wind that was before them, they overtook her, and the cold winter's wind that was behind them, she did not overtake them. And stop nor stay of that fool race did they make none until they came to the brink of the sea. Then every one of them said, High over cap! High over cap! And at that moment they were up in the air, and before Galish had time to remember where he was, they were down on dry land again, and were going like the wind. At last they stood still, and a man of them said to Galish, Galish, do you know where you are now? Not a no, says Galish. You're in France, Galish, said he. The daughter of the king of France is to be married tonight, the handsomest woman that the sun ever saw. And we must do our best to bring her with us, if we're only able to carry her off. And you must come with us that we may be able to put the young girl up behind you on the horse when we'll be bringing her away, for it's not lawful for us to put her sitting behind ourselves. But you're flesh and blood, and she could take a good grip of you so that you won't fall off the horse. Are you satisfied, Gulish? And will you do what we're telling you? Why shouldn't I be satisfied, said Gulish? I'm satisfied, surely, and anything that ye will tell me to do, I'll do it without doubt. They got off their horses there, and a man of them said a word that Gulish did not understand, and on the moment they were lifted up, and Gulish found himself and his companions in the palace. There was a great feast going on there, and there was not a nobleman or gentleman in the kingdom but was gathered there, dressed in silk and satin, and gold and silver, and the night was as bright as the day with all the lamps and candles that were lit, and Gulish had to shut his two eyes at the brightness. When he opened them again and looked from him, he thought he never saw anything as fine as all he saw there. There were a hundred tables spread out, and they're full of meat and drink on each table of them. Flesh meat, and cakes and sweet meats, and wine and ale, and every drink that ever a man saw. The musicians were at the two ends of the hall, and they were playing the sweetest music that ever a man's ear heard. And there were soon women and fine youths in the middle of the hall, dancing and turning, and going round so quickly and so lightly that it put a suron in Galicia's head to be looking at them. There were more there playing tricks, and more making fun and laughing, for such a feast as there that day had not been in France for twenty years, because the old king had no children alive but only the one daughter, and she was to be married to the son of another king that night. Three days the feast was going on, and the third night she was to be married, and that was the night that Gulish and the Shehogs came, 
hoping, if they could, to carry off with them the king's young daughter. Guleesh and his companions were standing together at the head of the hall, where there was a fine altar dressed up, and two bishops behind it waiting to marry the girl as soon as the right time should come. Now nobody could see the she-hogs, for they said a word as they came in that made them all invisible, as if they had not been in it at all. Tell me which of them is the king's daughter, said Guleesh, when he was becoming a little used to the noise and the light. Don't you see her there, away from you? said the little man that he was talking to. Guleesh looked where the little man was pointing with his finger, and there he saw the loveliest woman that was, he thought, upon the ridge of the world. The rose and the lily were fighting together in her face, and one could not tell which of them got the victory. Her arms and hands were like the lime, her mouth as red as a strawberry when it is ripe, her foot was as small and as light as another one's hand, her form was smooth and slender, and her hair was falling down from her head in buckles of gold. Her garments and dress were woven with gold and silver, and with the bright stone that was in the ring on her hand was as shining as the sun. Guleesh was nearly blinded with all the loveliness and beauty that was on her. But when he looked again, he saw that she was crying, and that there was the trace of tears in her eyes. It can't be, said Guleesh, that there's grief on her, when everybody around her is so full of sport and merriment. Musha, then, she is grieved, said the little man, for it is against her own will she's marrying, and she has no love for the husband she is to marry. The king was going to give her to him three years ago, when she was only fifteen, but she said she was too young, and requested him to leave her as she was yet. The king gave her a year's grace, and when that year was up, he gave her another year's grace, and then another, but at a week or a day he would not give her longer, and she is eighteen years old to-night, and it is time for her to marry. But indeed, says he, and he crooked his mouth in an ugly way, Indeed, it's no king's son she'll marry, if I can help it. Guleesh pitied the handsome young lady greatly when he heard that, and he was heartbroken to think that it would be necessary for her to marry a man she did not like, and what was worse, to take a nasty she hog for a husband. However, he did not say a word, though he could not help giving many a curse to that ill luck that was laid out for himself, to be helping the people that were to snatch her away from her home and from her father. He began thinking, then, what it was he ought to do to save her. But he could think of nothing. Oh, if I could only give her some help and relief, said he, I wouldn't care whether I were alive or dead, but I see nothing that I can do for her. He was looking on when the king's son came up to her and asked for a kiss, but she turned her head away from him. Guleesh had double pity for her then, when he saw the lad taking her by the soft white hand and drawing her out to dance. They went round in the dance near where Guleesh was, and he could plainly see that there were tears in her eyes. When the dancing was over, the old king, her father, and her mother, the queen, came up and said that this was the right time to marry her, that the bishop was ready, and it was time to put the wedding ring on her and give her to her husband. The king took the youth by the hand, and the queen took her daughter, and they went up together to the altar, with the lords and great people following them. When they came near the altar, and were no more than about four yards from it. The little she hog stretched out his foot before the girl, and she fell. Before she was able to rise again, he threw something that was in his hand upon her, said a couple of words, and upon the moment the maiden was gone from amongst them. Nobody could see her, for that word made her invisible. The little manin seized her and raised her up behind Guleesh, and the king nor no one else saw them, but out with them through the hall till they came to the door. Oro, dear Mary, it's there the pity was, and the trouble, and the crying, and the wonder, and the searching, and the rule con, when that lady disappeared from their eyes, and without their seeing what did it. Out of the door of the palace they went, without being stopped or hindered, for nobody saw them, and, my horse, my bridle, and saddle, says every man of them. My horse, my bridle, and saddle, says Guleesh and on the moment the horse was standing ready, caparisoned before him. Now jump up, Guleesh, said the little man, and put the lady behind you, and we will be going. The morning is not far off from us now. Guleesh raised her up on the horse's back, and leaped up himself before her, and rise, horse, said he, and his horse and the other horses with him went in a full race until they came to the sea. Hi over cap, said every man of them. 
hi over cap said guleesh and on the moment the horse rose under him and cut a leap in the clouds and came down in Aaron. they did not stop there but went of a race to the place where was guleesh's house in the rath and when they came as far as that guleesh turned and caught the young girl in his two arms and leaped off the horse i call and cross you to myself in the name of god said he and on the spot before the word was out of his mouth the horse fell down and what was in it but the beam of a plough of which they had made the horse and every other horse they had it was that way they made it some of them were riding on an old besom and some on a broken stick and more on a bohalon or a hemlock stock the good people called out together when they heard what guleesh said oh guleesh you clown you thief that no good may happen you why did you play that trick on us but they had no power at all to carry off the girl after guleesh had consecrated her to himself oh guleesh isn't that a nice turn you did us and we so kind to you what good have we now out of our journey to france never mind yet you clown but you'll pay us another time for this believe us you'll repent it he'll have no good to get out of the young girl said the little man that was talking to him in the palace before that and as he said the word he moved over to her and struck her a slap on the side of the head now says he she'll be without talk any more now guleesh what good will she be to you when she'll be dumb it's time for us to go but you'll remember us guleesh when he said that he stretched out his two hands and before guleesh was able to give an answer he and the rest of them were gone into the wrath out of his sight and he saw them no more he turned to the young woman and said to her thanks be to god they're gone would you not sooner stay with me than with them she gave him no answer there's trouble and grief on her yet says guleesh in his own mind and he spoke to her again i am afraid that you must spend the night in my father's house lady and if there is anything that i can do for you tell me and i'll be your servant the beautiful girl remained silent but there were tears in her eyes and her face was white and red after each other lady said guleesh tell me what you would like me to do now i never belonged at all to that lot of she hogs who carried you away with them i am the son of an honest farmer and i went with them without knowing it if i'll be able to send you back to your father i'll do it and i pray you make any use of me now that you may wish he looked into her face and saw the mouth moving as if she were going to speak but there came no word from it it cannot be said guleesh that you are dumb did i not hear you speaking to the king's son in the palace tonight or has that devil made you really dumb when he struck his nasty hand on your jaw the girl raised her white smooth hand and laid her finger on her tongue to show him that she had lost her voice and power of speech and the tears ran out of her two eyes like streams and guleesh's own eyes were not dry for as rough as he was on the outside he had a soft heart and he could not stand the sight of the young girl and she in that unhappy plight he began thinking with himself what he ought to do and he did not like to bring her home with himself to his father's house for he knew well that they would not believe him that he had been in france and brought back with him the king of france's daughter and he was afraid they might make a mock of the young lady or insult her and as he was doubting what he ought to do and hesitating he chanced to remember the priest glory be to god said he i know now what i'll do i'll bring her to the priest's house and he won't refuse me to keep the lady and care for her he turned to the lady again and told her that he was loath to take her to his father's house but that there was an excellent priest very friendly to himself who would take good care of her if she wished to remain in his house but if there was any other place she would rather go he said he would bring her to it she bent her head to show him she was obliged and gave him to understand that she was ready to follow him to any place he was going we will go out to the priest's house then said he he is under an obligation to me and will do anything i ask him they went together accordingly to the priest's house and the sun was just rising when they came to the door guleesh beat it hard and as early as it was the priest was up and opened the door himself he wondered when he saw guleesh and the girl for he was certain that it was coming wanting to be married they were guleesh guleesh isn't it the nice boy you are that you can't wait till ten o'clock or till twelve but that you must be coming to me at this hour looking for marriage you and your sweetheart you ought to know that i can't marry you at such a time or at all events can't marry you lawfully but ababoo 
said he suddenly as he looked again at the young girl. In the name of God, who have you here? Who is she, or how did you get her? Father, said Guleesh, you can marry me or anyone else if you wish, but it's not looking for marriage I came to you now, but to ask you, if you please, to give a lodging in your house to this young lady. The priest looked at him as though he had ten heads on him. But without putting any other question to him, he desired him to come in, himself and the maiden. And when they came in, he shut the door, brought them to the parlour, and put them to sitting. Now, Guleesh, said he, tell me truly, who is this young lady? And whether you're out of your senses, really, or are you only making a joke of me? I'm not telling a word of lie, nor making a joke of you, said Guleesh. But it was from the palace of the king of France I carried off this lady, and she is the daughter of the king of France. He began his story then, and told the whole to the priest, and the priest was so much surprised that he could not help calling out at times, or clapping his hands together. When Guleesh said from what he saw he thought the girl was not satisfied with the marriage that was going to take place in the palace before he and the Shehogs broke it up, there came a red blush into the girl's cheek, and she was more certain than ever that she'd sooner be as she was, badly off as she was, than be married to a wife of the man she hated. When Guleesh said that he would be very thankful to the priest if he would keep her in his own house, the kind man said he would do that as long as Guleesh pleased, but that he did not know what they ought to do with her because they had no means of sending her back to her father again. Guleesh answered that he was uneasy about the same thing, and that he saw nothing to do but to keep quiet until they should find some opportunity of doing something better. They made it up then between themselves that the priest should let on that it was his brother's daughter he had who was come on a visit to him from another county, and that he should tell everybody that she was dumb, and do his best to keep everyone away from her. They told the young girl what it was that they intended to do, and she showed by her eyes that she was obliged to them. Guleesh went home then, and when his people asked him where he had been, he said that he had been asleep at the foot of the ditch, and had passed the night there. There was great wonderment on the priest's neighbors at the girl who came so suddenly to his house without anyone knowing where she was from or what business she had there. Some of the people said that everything was not as it ought to be, and others that Guleesh was not like the same man that was in it before, and that it was a great story how he was drawing every day to the priest's house and that the priest had a wish and respect for him, a thing that they could not clear up at all. That was true for them indeed, for it was seldom the day went by but Guleesh would go to the priest's house and have a talk with him, and as often he would come used to hope to find the young lady well again, and with leave to speak, but alas, she remained dumb and silent without relief or cure. Since she had no other means of talking, she carried on a sort of conversation between herself and himself by moving her hand and fingers, winking her eyes, opening and shutting her mouth laughing or smiling, and a thousand other signs, so that it was not long before they understood each other very well. Guleesh was always thinking about he would send her back to her father, but there was no one to go with her, and he himself did not know what road to go, for he had never been out of his own country before the night that he brought her away with him, nor had the priest any better knowledge than he. But when Guleesh asked him, he wrote three or four letters to the king of France, and gave them to the buyers and sellers of wares who used to be going from place to place across the sea. But they all went astray, and never a one came to the king's hand. This was the way they were for many months, and Guleesh was falling deeper and deeper in love with her every day, and it was plain to himself and the priest that she liked him. The boy feared greatly at last lest the king should really hear where his daughter was and take her back from himself, and he besought the priest to write no more but to leave the matter to God. So they passed the time for a year, until there came a day when Guleesh was lying by himself on the grass, on the last day of the last month in autumn, and he was thinking over again in his own mind of everything that happened to him from the day that he went with the Shehogs across the sea. He remembered then, suddenly, that it was one November night that he was standing at the gable of the house, when the whirlwind came, and the Shehogs in it, and he said to himself, We have November night again, today, and I'll stand in the same place I was last year until I see if the good people come again. Perhaps I might see or hear something that would be useful to me, and might bring back her talk again to Mary. That was the name himself and the priest called the king's daughter, for neither of them knew her right name. He told his intention to the priest, and the priest gave him his blessing. Guleesh accordingly went to the old Roth when the night was darkening, 
and he stood with his bent elbow leaning on a grey old flag, waiting till the middle of the night should come. The moon rose up slowly, and it was like a knob of fire behind him, and there was a white fog which raised up over the fields of grass and all damp places, through the coolness of the night, after a great heat in the day. The night was calm, as is a lake, and there is not a breath of wind to move a wave on it. But there was no sound to be heard but the cronon of the insects would go by from time to time, or the hoarse sudden scream of the wild geese as they passed from lake to lake, half a mile up in the air over his head, or the sharp whistle of the golden and green plover rising and lying, lying and rising, as they do on a calm night. There were a thousand, thousand bright stars shining over his head, and there was a little frost out, which left the grass under his foot, white and crisp. He stood there for an hour, for two hours, for three hours. And the frost increased greatly, so he heard the breaking of the trunnings under his foot as often as he moved. He was thinking in his own mind at last that the she hoogs would not come that night, and that it was as good for him to return back again when he heard a sound far away from him, coming towards him, and he recognized what it was at the first moment. The sound increased, and at first it was like the beating of waves on a stony shore, and then it was like the falling of a great waterfall, and at last it was like a loud storm in the tops of the trees, and then the whirlwind burst into the wrath of one rout, and the she hogs were in it. It all went by him so suddenly that he lost his breath with it, but he came to himself on the spot, and put an ear on himself, listening to what they would say. Scarcely they had gathered into the wrath, till all began shouting and screaming and talking amongst themselves, and then each one of them cried out, My horse, and bridle, and saddle! My horse, and bridle, and saddle! And Guleesh took courage, and called out as loudly as any of them, My horse, and bridle, and saddle! My horse! and bridle, and saddle. But before the word was well out of his mouth, another man cried out, Ora, Guleesh, my boy, are you here with us again? How are you getting on with your woman? There's no use in your calling for your horse tonight. I'll go bail you won't play such a trick on us again. It was a good trick you played on us last year. It was, said another man. He won't do it again. Isn't he a prime lad? The same lad, to take a woman with him that never said as much to him as, How do you do, since this time last year, says the third man. Perhaps he likes to be looking at her, said another voice. And if the Omadon only knew that there was an herb growing up by his own door, and if he were to boil it and give it to her, she'd be well, said another voice. That's true for you. He is an Omadon. Don't bother your head with him. We'll be going. We'll leave the bodock as he is. And with that they rose up into the air, and out with them with one rulia bulia the way they came in. And they left poor Guleesh standing where they found him, and the two eyes going out of his head, looking after them and wondering. He did not stand long till he returned back, and he thinking in his own mind on all he saw and heard, and wondering whether there really was an herb at his own door that would bring back the talk to the king's daughter. It can't be, says he to himself, that they would tell it to me if there was any virtue in it. But perhaps the she hog didn't observe himself when he let the word slip out of his mouth. I'll search well as soon as the sun rises whether there's any plant growing beside the house except thistles and dockings. He went home, and as tired as he was, he did not sleep a wink until the sun rose on the morrow. He got up then. And it was the first thing he did, to go out and search well through the grass round the house, trying could he get any herb that he did not recognize. And indeed, he was not long searching till he observed a large strange herb that was growing up just by the gable of the house. He went over to it and observed it closely, and saw that there were seven little branches coming out of the stalk, and seven leaves growing on every branchine of them, and that there was a white sap in the leaves. It's very wonderful, he said to himself, that I never noticed this herb before. If there's any virtue in an herb at all, it ought to be in such a strange one as this. He drew out his knife, cut the plant, and carried it into his own house, stripped the leaves off of it, and cut up the stalk, and there came a thick white juice out of it, as there comes out of the sow thistle when it is bruised, except the juice was more like oil. He put it in a little pot and a little water in it, 
and laid it on the fire until the water was boiling. And then he took a cup, filled it half up with the juice, and put it to his own mouth. It came into his head then that perhaps it was poison that was in it, and that the good people were only tempting him that he might kill himself with that trick, or put the girl to death without meaning it. He put down the cup again, raised a couple of drops on the top of his finger, and put it to his mouth. It was not bitter, and indeed had a sweet, agreeable taste. He grew bolder then, and drank the fool of a thimble of it, and then as much again, and he never stopped till he had half the cup drunk. He fell asleep after that, and did not wake till it was night, and there was a great hunger and great thirst on him. He had to wait then, till the day rose, but he determined, as soon as he should wake in the morning, that he would go to the king's daughter and give her a drink of the juice of the herb. As soon as he got up in the morning, he went over to the priest's house with the drink in his hand, and never felt himself so bold and valiant and spirited and light as he was that day, and he was quite certain that it was the drink he drank that made him so hearty. When he came to the house, he found the priest and the young lady within, and they were wondering greatly why he had not visited them for two days. He told them all his news, and said he was certain that there was great power in that herb, and that it would do the lady no hurt, for he tried it himself and got good from it, and then he made her taste it, for he vowed and swore that there was no harm in it. Galish handed her the cup, and she drank half of it, and then fell back on her bed, and a heavy sleep came on her, and she never woke out of that sleep till the day on the morrow. Galish and the priest sat up the entire night with her, waiting till she should awake, and they between hope and unhope, between expectation of saving her, and fear of hurting her. She awoke at last when the sun had gone half its way through the heavens. She rubbed her eyes and looked like a person who did not know where she was. She was like one astonished when she saw Gulish and the priest in the same room with her, and she set up doing her best to collect her thoughts. The two men were in great anxiety, waiting to see would she speak, or would she not speak. And when they remained silent for a couple of minutes, the priest said to her, Did you sleep well, Mary? And she answered him, I slept, thank you. No sooner did Galish hear her talking than he put a shout of joy out of him, and ran over to her and fell on his two knees and said, A thousand thanks to God, who has given you back the talk. Lady of my heart, speak again to me. The lady answered him that she understood it was he who boiled that drink for her, and gave it to her, that she was obliged to him for her heart of for all the kindness he showed her since the day she first came to Ireland and that he might be certain that she would never forget it. Gulish was ready to die with satisfaction and delight. Then they brought her food, and she ate with a good appetite, and was merry and joyous, and never left off talking with the priest while she was eating. After that Gulish went home to his house, and stretched himself on the bed, and fell asleep again, for the force of the herb was not all spent, and he passed another day and a night sleeping. When he woke up he went back to the priest's house, and found that the young lady was in the same state, and that she was asleep almost since the time he had left the house. He went into her chamber with the priest, and they remained watching beside her till she woke the second time, and she had her talk as well as ever, and Gulish was greatly rejoiced. The priest put food on the table again, and they ate together, and Gulish used after that come to the house from day to day, and the friendship that was between him and the king's daughter increased, because she had no one to speak to except Gulish and the priest, and she liked Gulish best. So they married one another, and that was the fine wedding they had, and if I were to be there then, I would not be here now. But I heard from a Burdeen that there was neither cark nor care, sickness nor sorrow, mishap nor misfortune on them till the hour of their death. And may the same be with me and with us all. End of section two. Recording by Christopher Taylor.